this really is an absolute privilege as a as a a, a great fan and student of comedy, as so many of my listeners uh, know, to be sitting with uh, with Robert Smigel. Hello. <laughs> thank you. Thank if you, you say so. Thank you so thank so you. much for being here. It really does mean it, a lot. It's a pleasure, honestly. And um, like I said uh, before, we were old. Uh, Rabbi Markowitz is a friend of yours, and uh, he's a great man. And uh, from uh, Show Murray Torah and Fairlawn. Rabbi Andrew Markowitz, yes. one of the true greats, and this would not mm-hmm. have happened without his connecting friendship. And uh, I'm incredibly grateful to him. You know, this year Purim is like a it's like a heavy year when we're going into you know a festival that's supposed to be about yes. joy and comedy, and it yes. feels like this has been a very tough year for the Jewish people. And I want to actually begin mm-hmm. with a post that you wrote. You sent oh. it to me, and I found it very moving. It was very sweet. Yeah. You wrote right after Simchas Torah, which obviously we know is right yes. after October seventh. And you shared on social media, you said, Today was Simchas Torah, when Jews conclude reading the Torah for the year and celebrate the joy of Torah. Not to get too serious, I'm going to skip one of the lines, because that is... <laughs> slightly scatological? S- s- slightly scatological. Okay. But as a comedy writer, you said, I know nothing easier to mock than religion. For us, it's almost hackily simple at this point to make it appear childish and simplistic and primitive and i'm curious just to to almost linger on that statement for a second do you ever did you ever get uncomfortable with jewish portrayals in any of your comedy stuff or stuff that you were doing you were a writer on saturday night live Mm -hmm. you worked on conan yes Again, my favorite is the Dana Carvey show, which we'll, which we'll talk about briefly. You, you, you've written movies, which we'll get to in a moment. But I'm curious if, if the way Jews are sometimes portrayed, and like, does it ever irk? Well, uh, when I was a Saturday Night Live writer, I took a lot of pride in making fun of everybody. And I always felt that um, as long as I'm an equal opportunity Uh, quote unquote offender I didn't look at myself as like somebody who sets out to deliberately offend I just set out to point out things that I thought were funny and um, as long as I was even handed about it I didn't I felt almost a responsibility to not exclude uh, Jewish characters and um, I guess the first time I really um, had to uh, think twice even was when uh, I wrote a sketch called the Sabra Shopping Network, which was <laughs> essentially based on the Israeli <laughs> electronic store's own oh, owners okay, yeah. in Times Square. That uh, you know, when I was a kid in Times Square, there'd be all these stores that said going out of business. <laughs> Every it didn't matter. It was just like yeah. And eventually in Zohan, I. I wrote the movie Zohan sure, with Adam and with the Zohan. Apatow. We're talking a lot and, about that. Yeah, yeah. And, and they basically would pick up the phone, going out of business, how can I help you? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so I wrote this sketch, and the whole joke was that it was a phone-in, it was like Home Shopping yeah. Network, except you were forced to haggle <laughs> with the people on, on camera. And it was Tom Hanks, and it was Adam Sandler, who was actually the first sketch Adam Sandler ever appeared in on Saturday Night Live, oddly enough. And... Uh, and I asked my father, because my father was the very... The Dr. Irwin Dr. Smigel. Irwin Smigel, a very, you know, devout and um, serious serious Jew who, who, you know, lived through a lot of uh, dark times, anti-Semitic uh, times to say the least. And uh, I asked him what he thought. I, I showed him the sketch and he was like, he thought it was okay because he gave, but you would you would run it by him almost. Like, I ran that. I didn't do this habitually, but I did it with this sketch because I felt like, okay, am I really, am I crossing the line here? Am I making the Jewish people look bad or something? And he said, this is a subset of a of an ethnic group, and it's not like this doesn't exist. And he said it was fair, and for that reason, I went ahead with it. So I'm so glad that you brought up your, your father because I, I, I do want to mention it's not something that you talk about a whole lot and it's okay if, you, if you'd rather gloss over it, but your father and even I think almost more so when I spoke, your grandfather was instrumental in setting up Rav Chatzkel Besser's shul 
Yes. On the on the Upper West Side. Yeah, that was my grandfather. Your grandfather. He was a co-founder. Uh, Oscar. Oscar uh, Sebastian. Sebastian. Smigel. Sebastian Smigel. I knew he had one of those like old school good. <laughs> so did Jewish my father. You need to bring Irwin. back. Yeah. All those, you know, that whole era was when they were naming their kids out of after royalty a lot exactly times, but it was right, only the jews of, who were doing it so yes all these only jews the jews got left yes. with these like Sebastian, bernard right, exactly. lewis oh, high polluting names yes exactly it's like i had a, i had a teacher my dad hated the name erwin i had i, yeah. I had i had a teacher named uh, professor elisheva kalbach she's the Ooh. chair of jewish studies at columbia and she one time said Jews were so desperate to assimilate, they all figured the way to assimilate is to go to the opera. Like, that's what yeah. proper... And then they looked around at the opera house. It was just Jews there. It was, it was just Jews all trying in their minds. Like, <laughs> what's the only way that you we You know, it's could... funny because we always talk about parallels between the black community and the Jewish community, on, you know. Sure. And um, a lot of the jazz musicians... You know, when they would adopt those royalty nicknames like the Earl and, sure. and Duke, yeah. it was the same kind of the same. Thing. It was the same thing. It was some... like to yeah, to because they didn't want to be looked at as as lower status, and you know that's absolutely fascinating. But g going back to your father and grandfather, <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to do an hour on Duke Ellington. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to your father and 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 grandfather. Um, it, it's, it's really fascinating because yeah. the, the Judaism that it seems like they almost, they imparted or that you grew up in was yes. like a very rich, serious Judaism is, is, is that why you're so, so to speak, like so hesitant to like wheel out Judaism in comedy sketches because you, you really grew up fairly immersed in like yeah. a, a fairly rich I Jewish experience. I don't think experience. I'm that hesitant. I, I was hesitant there because it was you could argue that that's a negative stereotype. Yeah. These guys are trying to, you know, cheat you out of uh, something in, in, in theory. And um, so that time, but I mean, you know, I mean, I wrote a whole movie about Israelis. Uh, correct, correct. And then, we'll, uh, we'll get there, yeah. Yeah, and I actually wrote a movie with Adam um, and Chris Rock where he, it was a Jewish family in Long Island. So, um, but, yeah, I don't hesitate but, to but you're, necessarily. But what I'm really trying to get at yeah. is that, as opposed to many other Jewish comedians who, yeah. you know, they're Jewish, they have a very strong Jewish identity, but they mm. may not have had that immersive experience of somebody who's like setting up one of the most historic, serious synagogues in. Yeah. So do, do, do your friends know that like you come and you emerge from this like very immersive Jewish world? Um. I wouldn't say, I don't know if they would know the extent that, that, you know, that, that my dad, that my grandfather set up a, a a synagogue, but most of my uh, most of my friends in show business are not as they're just they just didn't grow up with, with the same the education same background. The same no, most of them didn't. I mean, I went to a day school. Yeah, you know, it was a conservative day school. Sure. I didn't. I you know, um, there was kind of a disconnect when I would go to the Stiebel. I love the atmosphere, but I didn't understand Hebrew well enough to yeah. really, you know, and, and you were kind enough to hand me this prayer book from the Stiebel. And, and well, we got in touch with Rabbi Best. Yeah, no, it's I'm wonderful. That you mentioned it's it. We wonderful. got you the original yeah. Machzor and a Tehillim. It's amazing and uh, beautiful, but it takes me back to like being eight years old and opening this book that's and all Where Hebrew are we right now? And feeling a little <laughs> lost, you know. It was a very friendly and warm atmosphere, though, and... Uh, very egalitarian, like Stiebel's are. Where yeah, there's no there's no hierarchy. Which Zero, is, which fancy is, board or anything. Yeah, like none that. of that. It's wonderful, and um, and so I always enjoyed it, but I don't feel like I, you know, it, it it was hard for me to really get a lot out of it in terms of understanding. Yeah, Judaism. You know, I, it was it was. I, I mean, I got some of that from my day school. But when your your father passed, and this is really how yeah. you know Rabbi Markowitz, yes. if you're comfortable talking about it, you you actually again, if I understand correctly, you said Kaddish for the full yes for for, for the full year, but you're yes. you're, you're working. You're on. <laughs> set. How how are you doing that? I was um, it's very interesting. Well, I I I absolutely wanted to say Kaddish because I knew my dad would want me to, and um, I. Adam Sandler asked me to direct a movie, write and direct a movie that summer. This is the movie that happens to be about Jewish family in Long Island. 
And um, so I spent, so, you know, I, this was very manageable until I, you know, I joined the Fairlawn, uh, you know, sure. Shomri Torah. And I got to meet Rabbi Yudin, who's one of the most inspiring he was under Man, my chuppah. My wife is uh, it grew up in a shul. Oh, that's amazing. Yep, he's he's literally one of, he's one of a kind, a legend and a giant. Absolutely, absolutely. And and I asked him, you know, because by now this was like a few months into saying Kaddish, and I had so much respect for him, and I, I I wanted I didn't want to take the job unless he thought this was manageable. And I explained to him that okay, uh, Adam is going to set it up so that. I can do um, that. I'll be able to say Kaddish on the set. That we'll get people from the neighborhood. A minion. Yeah, we'll get a minion. Uh, we'll get people from the neighborhood. Were you saying Kaddish? I mean, it's okay yeah. for Mincha and yeah, three times a day. Yes, Shachas, yes. Mincha, Marv. Yeah, Mincha and Marv were almost always together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Didn't do the afternoon Mincha, but so it was like, yeah. So twice a twice a day, I would um, you know immerse myself in this. Usually, usually I could do it in the morning before we had to shoot, but in the afternoon and evening, most of the time or quite often, uh, you know, if, if it spilled into the evening, even in the summer with the late hours, I would have to step aside and, and do this. And they would actually have people, um, on the movie set. Yeah. There were like two synagogues in that area that maybe three that, that all contributed and uh, we, you know, that we just got the word out, and and people would come, and and they would uh, say Kaddish in in like a trailer sometimes, or on the set. For real, yeah, for real. And and but before I took the job, I asked Rabbi Uten about it because, you know, this was this was new to me, and I was like, a minion. Okay, so I'll grab ten Jews from the, and he was like, nope can't do that that's not gonna the, it's, it's not gotta gonna it's gotta be at least six people who really know what they're doing is what he told me he said you can't just pull people from the right off the street like in well, the, or just any people yeah, who are jewish correct. who are on the who six don't know, who how actually to pray. know how to answer six who absolutely yep. can do it uh including myself so um so that's where i that was makes like, it a lot more complicated too well it made it like okay so now i'm really going to take this seriously and make sure that you know there are people from the neighborhood who really know what they're doing and you know for, for the most part it was it, would, it was 10 people each time because when you were because done, people were very willing to help us when you were done were you exhausted like think when i was done say kaddish uh, you mean the After last the, day? Yeah, exactly. Well, I cried the last day because I felt, you know, a connection to my dad. Through that daily. Through doing it. It was very, you know, comforting. Emotional. It was very comforting uh, to to have that all year round. I mean, these are traditions that, you know, I always say to my kids that um, a lot of the value, and this is something I learned not early in life, a lot of the value of, Judaism and everything that's taught is not about what it might appear to be literally, which is just asking God yeah. for, you know, uh, doing this so that God will reward Correct. you. It's a reward in itself. And it's, uh, you know, uh, and for me, that reward was feeling this connection to my father and, uh, and having that. And just like Shiva, same thing. You know, my father passed away on uh, Sukkot. Sure. So like the first night or uh, day of Sukkot. And, uh, and, and so older. we had he was to, like 90, 90, he was 92. 92 yeah. And he, and so we were like, my first instinct when I heard, Oh, you can't have Shiva till after. And I was like, Oh my God, this is already so hard and painful. But it ended up being like, I, I, you know, then I had two weeks to, to just think about my dad and, yeah. and really, I mean, the value of Shiva is just, you know, I, I feel bad for people who, you know, I have a lot of friends who they'll have a shiva for like a day. Yeah, because you know? it gets into yeah. Well, they just it's just like oh, a lot of practice, people just do custom, it. They'll like just a one day. Yeah, yeah they'll have a one days, day yeah. shiva, and it's like I understand the impulse, like that this is a big investment. Yeah. But I, having gone through it, it was just so comforting, and it it it, it I, just having the connection with my father again, and really immersing myself and people talking about my father, it just helped. You know, there's no such thing as closure, but it, it certainly contributed to 
know. did he get a lot of nachas from your comedy? Ooh. You come from a long line oh of, my God, did of he dentists. Get it's like almost like a <laughs> yes. Willy Wonka story. <laughs> like his backstory <laughs> is he grew up in such a severe dentist home, and I grew up with a real fear of dentistry. Uh, my listeners yeah. know. Well, this. I give my dad a lot of credit for like um, changing that. Uh, changing that attitude toward dentistry because he he sort of developed the tooth bonding technique and and that and he, and he became really the uh, of all the dentists in the country he became like the ambassador for aesthetic dentistry and um, and so dentistry became this thing that wasn't all about just cavities and drilling and root canals and even even before before he came up with tooth bonding you know the idea of like getting caps that was the alternative sure. and that's not a pleasant thing either no. grinding your teeth down and putting caps my son's already traumatized yeah that this yeah he's yeah. no but like tooth bonding became this much more you know user friendly or or patient friendly version of that and uh, but he got nachas from you when i so, told so, yeah so yeah he uh, i thought i was going to be a dentist for because i didn't think i could succeed at at this field <laughs> under so, any circumstance. When I told my father that yeah. I'm going to start writing a comedy column for, <laughs> in a from outlet, his first reaction, his face like got tense, and he said, like full-time? Like that was his initial right. reaction. Like right. full-time? Like, it's a hobby. Great, it's a hobby. The, it's a nice so what, hobby. You came, like he's a serious <laughs> professional. Your grandfather was also a dentist, or he was in? Yeah, my grandfather was a dentist. Come from a line. Most people who are dentists... <laughs> have, have it in the family. Have it in the family. <laughs> it's not like you know. Very few people are like that kid in uh, Rudolph and Red Nosed Reindeer, um, the elf who wants to be a dentist. Yeah. But um, the uh, yeah, my dad. My dad didn't really want to be a dentist, but it was a different era, and you know he. Uh, but he gave you his blessing when you said like I, I want to pursue this full time. Well, here's what happened. I mean, he, my, they, he was incredibly supportive, and my mom was too. And I, he, my dad was a very creative person. He loved books, and he, he would, you know, and he was a theater counselor, you know, at the camp that I ended up going to years later. And so there was a part of him, and he loved taking me to, you know, sophisticated plays, Harold Pinter plays, and Groucho Marx movies. He turned me on to so much stuff. Uh, creative stuff uh, in my uh, childhood. So there was always that part of him. But at the same time, you know, uh, nobody thought this was an easy thing to get Build into. Build a career around. Yeah. yeah. So it was always like, you know, get the thing and then have it to fall back on. And so, and honestly, I didn't really think I could succeed at this. So I went and took, and I had no, no other aspiration other than to be funny that's the only thing that i uh, I, I mean yeah i would have liked to play for the knicks but i gave yeah. that up at around 12 <laughs> i figured that out yeah, about 12. you got that memo yeah. yeah but at the same time i continued to be like the funny kid in my class who sure. impersonated people drew cartoons of people wrote songs about people and uh and so that never went away but i never believed that i could succeed at it so i went ahead and was a pre-dental student I got into the best school I could get into, which was Cornell, and and I was a disaster. I I couldn't. I the level of pre dental, the level of difficulty for a pre med course, like uh, you know chemistry. Yeah, pre, you're pre orgo, like it's certain. yeah, yeah, and it's so much harder than what I was. And science was never my best subject. I I got through it by working hard in high school, but it's a whole other level. You know, these are weed out courses in college. Correct. You know, the pre separate the strong. Yeah. Yes, they're they're going at like lightning speed, and I was just devastated. And my parents uh, are very compassionate about it. And after um, you, it's like set up. Did you like like reach out to them? And say, I don't think. Well, I mean, I told them this is not taking. I told them I got a D minus in chemistry. <laughs> I was like in shock and uh, and you know in tears because I'd never experienced anything like that. And they they immediately, you know, like flipped the switch and were incredibly sympathetic and supportive. But I stuck with it, you know, for another year. And then after two years, I was just a very depressed kid in terms of just not feeling aimless. And 
and not feeling like I was doing that well. I had, I had done okay, but um, I asked if I could go to NYU for a year and just take acting and communications, all those so kind like of fantasies. Jewish dentist father's worst nightmare. That's like a scale. <laughs> well, they, you know, it was like a year. A year, okay. So they let me do it, and I had a great time, but I realized that, okay, so I like writing, I like acting but it doesn't mean that I can do it for a career and it doesn't, and I certainly didn't think that I should continue college. It just felt like this is something I can do after college gotcha. if I want to, but because I had already taken enough courses that I'd enjoyed psychology, government that I, it, I absorbed the concept that I've got a four year window here where I'm going to be learning from brilliant professors and in a, I'm never going to have this opportunity again. So I didn't want to waste it in my mind by taking communications or radio production, you yeah. know, these kind of things. I, I just felt like I could do that later. So I went off and um, I stayed at NYU and just finished. I, I majored in political science and, and I finished the pre-dental requirements because I still thought. Maybe. Maybe, well, or likely that that's, I, I, I didn't see myself doing anything else. I had no other aspirations, like I said. But then one day, there was, I found out that there was a stand-up comedy contest at NYU. And I had always resisted going to a local comedy club like the Comic Strip sure. on um, open mic night because I was worried someone would see me and I would bomb. But I was living with my parents when I had to go back to NYU. When I went back to NYU, I had to live with my parents because NYU had not bought the entirety of Greenwich Village yet. <laughs> and so they had a shortage of dorms and Manhattan kids weren't allowed to live in dorms. So I had a very strange, I, I still enjoyed, you know, uh, the acting year, but then I, yeah, I, I was just taking these courses and I was a pretty depressed kid at this point, but I thought to myself, well, nobody at NYU is going to know who I am. <laughs> so I entered this contest and I wrote an act and I was one of the winners. And, and that was like your sign that like I can. Yeah. I was the first time I'd ever felt like, well, I made strangers laugh with my own material. What's so interesting to me. I mean, we're sitting now in my office yeah. in a home in Teaneck. Um, yeah. You know, you, 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 you came in here, which means a great deal to me. What what always has fascinated me about you, and I've watched a lot of interviews, though you've already caught me on one movie of yours that I did not watch, and I apologize, <laughs> okay. I apologize for that. No one saw it. But but you've <laughs> worked, <laughs> but you've worked with the pantheon of Com Conan, Lorne Michaels on SNL, mm -hmm. Dana Carvey. I'm always fascinated with Charlie Kaufman, <laughs> uh, who's a writer on the Dana Carvey yes. Show, the Oscar sure. winning sure. Uh, for Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, Bob Odenkirk, mm -hmm. and you present. So unusually down to earth in all of your interviews. <laughs> and I'm curious where that comes from. The only person who's even like near your universe is actually Adam Sandler, who doesn't oh. like <laughs> the yeah. man is just not. <laughs> but you, you hang out among celebrities. You've written yeah. movies. Why do you think that, that culture or that presence of celebrity is something you have never. Well, it might have to do if you brought up Adam. I mean. So I connected with different people at Saturday Night Live in different ways, you know, I like Dana Carvey. I loved making, creating characters through impressions and yeah. the musicality of abstract impressions. And Conan, there was the side of us that we shared that saw people as cartoons and had this, you know, detached approach to life and, and comedy. And then Adam is the other person that I really connected with at Saturday Night Live. And it was a completely different kind of connection, even though we both shared... You know, we had a very silly sense of humor, but we also, there weren't a lot of Jewish kids at Saturday Night Live, actually. There weren't, uh, especially on the, on the writing staff, too. And uh, believe it or not, you, you know, there's that stereotype of Jewish comedy writers and everybody in comedy is Jewish. But when I got to Saturday Night Live, it was just me and Al Franken on the writing staff. And, uh, oh, and the comedian Carol Liefer. Oh, and six other people. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, just those three. And uh, love it's in the cast. And, uh, and that was it. And then um, and it was a very Harvard Lampoon kind of dry sure. yeah. approach to comedy that I kind of admired great, yeah. a great deal. And um, when Adam came, like six years later, five years later, 
he was this guy I really connected with in a completely different way. He had really supportive, loving parents. And he grew up in a loving Jewish, very proud Jewish family. And um, my Auntie Goldie, I, I want my Auntie Goldie, who I mentioned that from that funeral. Yeah. She lives right near Adam. She was close with Adam's parents. Oh. Yeah. In, in, New, in Hampshire. New Hampshire. Yeah. yeah New Hampshire. Manchester. Yeah. 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 They moved from Brooklyn and. Um, but continue. Yeah. So you. No. And, um, you know, I mean, there, we, there are a lot of differences between us. Adam grew up in New Hampshire and he, he had to deal with anti-Semitism in a way that I never did. I grew up on the Upper West Side. Yeah, that's, that's not... <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I didn't realize that uh, but did you half get... the population wasn't Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> did you get it from Adam, though? Meaning, like, I didn't get it from you Adam, but I... You don't carry as, like, you walk into a shul, you just go, like... I think my dad, uh, you know, on the one hand, was very... Uh, he could be very confident and bombastic about you know when he's like on television talking about uh tooth bonding or or he actually sold a toothpaste on qvc for many years <laughs> is that true a great deal of confidence yeah we still sell it it's called super smile if anybody's interested <laughs> it's an standing toothpaste um tooth whitening toothpaste that my mother created with him and uh but anyway um but my dad uh set a real example always of being um I always thought of him as very uh, humble and, and down to earth and um, just not interested uh, and very interested in, um, you know, uh, how can I put this? He, he was, he just, he, he just led by example, you know, he, he, and he told us at a very young age, you know, life is, meaningless unless you make a contribution he 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 really looked at um he looked at things from uh, a place that i really admired just being grateful for what you have and and paying it forward any way you can and that and stays with you stays with me and and as i learned later that, that that's a really one of the most jewish concepts yeah. imaginable and i didn't really understand that when I was a kid, because I was a high holiday Jew for the most part, sure. even though we were part of this family that had founded this Stiebel, we ourselves were not raised. We had a kosher home. I went to a conservative synagogue synagogue's uh, school. Sure, that ended up being it's it's basically it's Heschel now. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. and um, but um, but we didn't go to synagogue regularly when I was young, and. And it wasn't until I started having to go at a later age, first when my dad was very sick in my 30s, um, he had a, a very serious uh, illness that, thank God, he lived 25 years. We found a great doctor that helped him. But um, but I would go to shul every Saturday for to, you know, uh, because I wanted to... Uh, Say the prayer for the sick, basically. Really? Yeah, we're foolish lema, and yeah. uh, you know, but it felt weird that I was just doing. I felt hypocritical in a way, and so I tried to concentrate on just being grateful when I said the prayer instead of asking for something. And then I started going on Sixteenth Street at Young Israel um, because I lived in the village, and it was a different kind of sermon that I was not familiar with until. I started going every week where the rabbi, he sat on a very high perch, which I always yeah. found very amusing, but it was a conversation. He basically had a conversation with, with the congregants, with the congregants about the like crowd work, about almost. the Parsha. Oh, wow. <laughs> crowd work. <laughs> well, I've seen it in other synagogues since, but it was the first time. And it was the first time I really started absorbing uh, the meaning behind well, what we're doing here. Everything. Yeah. And you know, and that, so that was a start. And then, um, your grandfather did, did you know your grandfather? Oh yeah. Did, yeah. did he, but he was not, he, he did not, um, you know, talk about religion so much. He just did it. It was like, he just did it. Yeah. Head down. Just like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really until I was older again. And, um, well, there were two stages. There was one where 
So yeah, you know, I had this thing where I was kind of proud of myself. Oh, see, I, I, I have perspective here. I, I'm grateful. I'm not asking God for anything. But then my kid, uh, my first child was diagnosed with autism, uh, Daniel. And, and you've done uh, a lot of incredible work in that. Well, well, perhaps, but I, I, he's wonderful. And, you know, but at the time, it was a very different era where everything was focused on a cure. And autism was looked at as this, you know, disastrous thing. Yeah. That, it, there was no, there was no, you know, mainstream idea of acceptance. Sure. Uh, every, every organization that we, you know, were in contact with was about finding a cure. Gotcha. Or about some kind of, um, you know, dietary thing that will remove it or, yeah. help, or start to remove it. Very little about acceptance. And so, you know, it was a very hard thing to absorb, obviously. I was terrified for my son. And um, but and you, and then your mind goes to those classic, you know, why is this happening kind Correct. of stuff. Correct, uh, yeah. You know, why is, did, did I do something wrong and that kind of stuff. And then I just had this, <laughs> I just realized that I was feeling a kind of pain that was so foreign to me but something that people experience all over the world every day. And, and realizing that I was like, Oh, this is what I read about when, you know, families are, you know, wiped out in wars and, yeah. and you know, or, or famines or, or pandemics. And, and I, I started to understand that it was more about, you know, that you can't and then and then the more i went to synagogue the more it reinforced the idea that like when things like this happen you can't really ask why they happen but just what can i do because you kind of realize that um it reminds you that this is what we're here for we're here to alleviate each other's pain we're here for each other and at the time i was like why isn't this emphasized enough in Judaism why why isn't this and then I realized like when I would go to shul more that it that it is at the heart of Judaism but when you go as a high holiday Jew yeah you really don't get that yeah you really you know unless you're really paying attention to like the Haftorah on Yom Kippur <laughs> yeah like really <laughs> tough slot which is, yeah which is one of my favorite you know Yona's my absolute favorite yeah yeah and uh but you know if you're going just for the high holidays, you're probably not paying that close attention. And, and so you don't realize that, you know, Judaism as is as much about our relationship with God as it, I mean, it's, it's as much about our relationship with each other yes. as it is with our relationship with God. And that's, you know, and it's a shame that people don't understand that when they, when either they go casually yeah because like what if you go casually it's like i'm i sinned and i'm apologizing and then it's very like reciprocal almost yes yeah. it's very reciprocal and you don't get the checking I, the box yeah or, yeah and, and you're not getting the sense that this is you, when you go every week you and and you have a brilliant rabbi who's explaining the parsha or somebody like rabbi yudin who does it with the most incredible passion yes and, and and then you understand that that this is about a this is a blueprint of how to live, a thousand percent. I you know I'm curious about you know you probably the movie that for for the public introduced a lot of Israeli culture. You mentioned it before was don't mess with the Zohan. You don't was, mess with the Zohan. Yeah, yes. You don't, yes. Don't mess with the Zohan. Uh -huh. And that that movie was, you know, I looked back at it, especially, you know, you, you had this post, post-October 7th, and there's a lot of, there's been an, just an upswelling of attention, criticism, and, and anti-Semitism that has yes. bubbled up since October 7th. And one of the things that I was, that I was wondering is like, do, when this was happening, the last couple of months, have you thought back at the movie Don't Mess With The Zohan and wonder like, would you even be able to make that movie today? Did, <laughs> did you get criticism at the time? No, we did it at a time where, there was a window of time where it was not at the forefront of everyone's. We wrote that movie in the year 2000 and then nine 11 happened. And obviously 
Because the movie, just a, for our listeners, well, Adam Sandler plays this like renegade. Uh, he plays a Mossad agent who who's becomes, incredibly skilled. Yes, almost to like superhero proportions. But his real passion is that he wants to be a hairdresser. Yeah. So he fakes his death and uh, goes to New York and uh, becomes a hairdresser. And then, and then, but unfortunately for Lee Zohan, <laughs> his life follows him to New York. Correct. But, uh, yeah, so that's what, that's, <laughs> that's the log line of that movie. And um, it was written... Again, it was written in the year 2000, and then after 9-11, when, you know, everything blew up, and, and well, everything blew up, uh, bad choice of words, but, but meaning that um, there was... Uh, there was so much more attention to the... so much more... Re terrorism, was terrorism was a real thing. Terrorism was a real thing, and not only that, but, um, you know, there was certainly a faction of people blaming our involvement with Israel for it. And Osama bin Laden was fairly clear but yeah he well he, there were other reasons you yeah. know um, our presence in you know Correct. saudi arabia our yeah, 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 military such, presence. Such. there was a lot of you know our basically american imperialism you know i always tried to stress that back then to people <laughs> who were trying to just blame israel but um but we were um we were very reluctant to move forward with it and we we tabled it then there was a period where they wanted to revive it and they wanted to make it, and I made a, so if you remember the movie. Um, Emmanuel Shariki plays. Emmanuel Shariki plays a Palestinian, a Palestinian. woman. She's, yeah, so Zohan works at a, an electronic store uh, that a big fan of his. Yeah. Because a lot of the movie was mocking the way we glorify war or, or, we, or that we can on both sides. And so he was a big, uh, you know, uh, he'd heard about the Zohan, so he had him work in the electronic store to get started and then Zohan sees a, um, a hair, a hair salon and it's run by a Palestinian woman, but the, you know, and they eventually, uh, she hires him and he ends up being amazing because he's horny and, uh, the women, <laughs> it Correct. played on that. It played on another, uh, stereotype yeah. that, um, you know, of the, the horny the, foreign yeah. guy. So anyway, you know, the point we were trying to go for was that they were kind of treated and looked on the same way and mistaken for each other Yeah, here in America. And, and that they kind of were able to get along in a different way here because Correct. they were thousands of miles away from the real uh, conflict. And, and, you know, we created this common enemy which was this ruthless Trump-like real estate developer. Yes. Played by Michael Buffer, the, the wrestling announcer. Um, and, and the common enemy kind of, you know, he saw them as just people whose businesses he wanted to tear down so that he could build a, a shopping mall or whatever. And um, anyway, the point of it, w that was the point of the movie. We were trying to find... What what we have what in brings common. us together what brings us together, States, yeah. which is something I've tried to do in the other movies I've made as well. Because, uh, but anyway, uh, so we we had that theme, and then nine eleven happened. We tabled it, and then the studio wanted us to rewrite it and make it about uh, real terrorists, a real terrorist cell that that Zohan would overtake in America. And I was like, no, I have no interest in that. I didn't want to do it because I just, I, I didn't think that was, I, that's not going to, that's not going to move us forward. That's choosing a side. Yeah. And um, so I had no interest. There were a couple of people who did take a shot at it. They didn't make that movie. Then Adam and I went, revisited it and made it a fictional country. Ah. Uh, we, we made them fictional countries. And that they was were, deliberate to avoid. This is this, this isn't how the movie ended up, but this is in like 2004. Okay, <laughs> we made a draft where they were fictional countries, and uh, we didn't have the same story. Uh, Zohan ended up becoming a stuntman for like a Martin Scorsese movie, and he oh he was oh he gets to hairdress Mariah Carey. He actually became Mariah okay. Carey's hairdresser. I don't even remember how it ended, but it was funny. But we tabled it again. And then in 2006, Adam just felt like 
let's just make the movie we wrote originally. It's it's okay now. We can we can do this now. And enough time has passed. Since enough like, time has passed, and we made a few changes, but ultimately, we went back to the original movie. Mm-hmm. And um, whether I mean, if we did something like that now, I just think there'd be so much anger around it. Correct. Like it's just like unfortunately, I feel like a lot of a lot of uh, media, a lot of um, comedy, a lot of music, even. Um, it's kind of designed to feed on people's anger and paranoia and, and it's an easy thing to do. And, um, because, you know, recently Jon Stewart, whether you agreed with him or not, he, he did a daily show segment about, um, Trump and Biden. Sure. He, he, he implied that, you know, maybe they should do a better job showing that Biden is fit for office. And so many people got angry, furious, furious. And some people said, I read one article, I could not believe it, said, this is 2024, is Jon Stewart still the right person to host The Daily Show? Because the both sidesism thing doesn't play anymore. Yeah, correct. I'm like, are you telling me that all political comedy needs to be a pep rally for one side or the other with no nuance and and we're just supposed to choose a side and act as uh, surrogate campaigners and never point out any hypocrisy or flaw in the side that we support, uh, you know, that's not comedy. Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of political comedy has devolved into that. Has devolved into that. So for me, even though I, you know, I would not uh, lead with, I mean, it's, it, it reminded me of like when Clinton was president and all the Democratic or liberal comedians just made fun of him being a horn dog. Yeah. Including me when I was on Conan, and when I did cartoons on SNL, it and was don't all about the famous Dana Carvey sketch, which we don't need to. Get oh into yeah, that. yeah. But it was always about him being a horn dog because uh, we didn't want to make fun of his policies. That's the that you know. So when you're trying to be even handed, usually the liberal comic will will hit somebody personally Correct. on his side, and then the policies on the Maybe, other side. Exactly. Not that Trump doesn't have a million personal yeah, but. <laughs> aspects that you can hit, but, but a lot of times it's more about their policies. And in this case, um, uh, yeah, nowadays, a lot of these shows, they just seem like um, pep rallies for one side or the other. And, and so I... I felt like what John was doing was kind of a breath of fresh air and somewhat satisfyingly his, his audience increased the next week. Correct. Correct. He actually, he said something for real. Well, he got people's attention. It was like, he got people's attention and people appreciated it. And, and he, um, the, the second show, you would have thought the first show back would have been the big one. Yeah. But the second show had a bigger audience than the first one. It had the biggest audience since the final John Stewart Daily Show. Literally, yeah, nine years. There's a hunger. They for hadn't it had now a big, in in comedic discourse in the way. People I would like are. to think there's a hunger for nuance, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> an actual, uh, you know, rather than just an echo chamber, yeah. Um, but what, what, you know, we'll see. When you think back to "Don't Mess with the Zohan," and you were yeah. you were you taken aback in the last couple months at the because the whole mo- the premise of the movie is that we actually have more in common, especially in America. We yes. don't we don't need to recreate the conflict in in Israel over here in America. Were you taken aback or surprised at all by the level of vitriol and how? People who seemingly shouldn't have such passionate animated stakes in this on college campuses or whatever it is are are protesting. Is there a part of you saying like, why why is Israel? How did that become the proxy for all that is unjust in the world and mobilizing college campuses? How do you how do you process? Well, that? Well, there's a lot going on, and part of it is you know has been written about, and before that even happened, and some very very smart books like Jews Don't Count. Yeah, David uh, Badil. Yeah, where, you know, it's a complicated thing where we're seen as white and people forget because we, you know, Jewish people have had a lot of success in this country. Um, they're kind of lumped in as being white. And there's a lot of 
you know, some of it justified, some of it over the top, uh, resentment toward white people in this country. It's, it's very, it's one of the only things you can like make fun of as a group nowadays yeah. is like white people. And, uh, which is, you know, I, and I, I think that I, I get like, I've never been like somebody who's been, a against progress in comedy. I, honestly, like, you know, if, if there are words that, that bother people, I get that. Uh, you know, I, I, I came from a place where I always thought like every word should be, uh, every word that intent should matter and that every word should be, um, should not be off limits. If your intent is like blazing saddles is one of the most progressive yeah. anti-racism movies. Yeah. Probably the most anti-racism comedy of the, sure. of that era. And yet, you know, you could make a case that it's like not doable because it's triggering because of that sure. word. And, um, and, you know, I get that. And, and when I hear that, I, you know, my first instinct is, is what I just said. And then the, what I always try to do is like, well, what if, what if somebody was using uh, a Jewish slur over yeah. and over and over, you know, it might bother me if I felt like it wasn't, being done with real thought and real intent if it was just being done kind of haphazardly. And uh, so I, I try to always, you know, substitute my, yeah. <laughs> my people's uh, slurs uh, for those situations to see. Cause like, you know, things like blackface, like 30 rock dropped it because uh, the, the episodes that mentioned it because, sure. and, the, and even though the joke was that blackface was wrong, yeah, there was, um, you did something similar with the racist from Maine. Skinheads from Skinhead Maine. Skinhead from Maine. Yeah, but there was no, you know, but we didn't say I any love slur. That. Yeah, no, but, you were no slurs. Yeah. There was no slur that would trigger anybody. It was just depicting racist people from Maine who spoke in that charming. Charming, exactly. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Looks like the weather's getting <laughs> turning. One of the only things the Jews don't control, I guess. <laughs> uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think that you could maybe still get away with that one now i think although everything's so but have you been subject personally in any way of people distancing themselves or or ever been subject to to anti-semitism in that way um i've encountered a few people now and then who've suggested that like just absurdly that I got Saturday Night Live because I was Jewish, and they, they like I said, they're yeah, like, the, <laughs> like oh, you guys just hire each other, right? That kind of thing. Uh -huh. And I tried to explain what I said earlier, which was that I was like, me and Al Franken were the only Jews on a, yeah on a large staff back then. I, I would uh, be I would be remiss if I did not ask you uh, about one aspect of of triumph and. You could, you could, you could correct me if I'm wrong. I think you mentioned in passing uh, on an interview, I think fairly recently, that the voice from Triumph <laughs> you actually got from your grandparents. I would say Their that's cadence? pretty close. Yeah, yeah. I mean, which so grandparents were that? My mom's grandparents. My mom's family. My mom's parents. Were they survivors? Were, were are you? They they escaped Russia at the time of the revolution. Uh, they actually took a train and then crossed the border into China. Sure. And they settled in. They were the Jews of Shanghai. Wow. You, you know that sure. story. And, uh, so, was he in yeshiva? Like, but part of that, there was a yeshiva in Shanghai for a period. The yeah, Mir. they were not as religious uh, okay. as my but they got dad's that side train, of the family. Uh, they got, yeah, it's a fascinating story. So they went yeah, through yeah, Shanghai. Yeah, they carried everything they had and, um, you know, uh, yes, settled in Shanghai and Harbin. And then they ended up uh, in the Philippines and then finally in the United States. Um, and um, so they had, you know, their first generation immigrants with thick Russian accents. And, and that's like, kind of like that. I think there was something subconscious about the playful way they would talk to me. And when I would see a dog and dogs are kind of like, and cats are, but I never had that voice for cats. It was only for dogs. And I used to say, <laughs> And this always sounded so, you know, reductionist, I guess. But like I, it, this was a very the kind of thing that Conan and I would bond on when I would reduce people to cartoons. Like the 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 accent reminded me of uh, or a dog's face 
<laughs> dog's excited face uh, reminded me of a Russian immigrant right off the boat looking at New York from, Excitedly from like, the point of Ellis Island. Look at all of these. <laughs> that kind of just unfettered wonder uh, and excitement <laughs> and sort of being a blank slate entering this new world. I always like to follow your career uh. because I love knowing what movies Zach Galifianakis turned down. You Let's think. be honest, okay. you're like the fourth guy they call, right? I mean, when you can't get Will Ferrell or Carell or Zach, then right. you call Paul Rudd and you say, Paul, do you have Danny McBride's phone number? Did you ever, because, you know, sitting with you and you are so gracious, soft-spoken, and you seem like you like to be nice to people. You're, you, you don't, have, it's the opposite of your personality. Yeah. Have you ever felt like you needed to either apologize or feel like that, like, that, like, knot in your stomach when you're doing triumph and you're insulting <laughs> and you see their face where, like, they're, maybe they don't fully get the joke, they're not fully in on it, there and you either want to like circle it's back happened. and be like... I'm Usually so people are in on the joke and every now and then I'll see a face and I'll say, oh, I probably went too far. And I might make a joke as triumph in character backing away in some kind of humorous way. Gotcha. And um, it's funny you say that because a lot of times when I get a knot in my stomach is after I do an interview as myself. And I'm like, did I just say something that's going to piss off or, or <laughs> bum out somebody? And, and I've driven reporters crazy. Like, did I, did it sound like I was, you know, but with Triumph, uh, I remember the actress Megan Fox. So I was in yeah, a movie with. That's absolutely. Uh, this is 40. Oh, yeah. Oh, so you saw that interview with Triumph? Yeah, of course I did. I've seen all. Uh, all okay. Of, well, that. A, Judd I'm, Apatow. I, was I missed in, one of your movies. That's, uh, okay. that's okay. So I was an actor in that movie. It's a great uh, scene. This is 40, yeah, with Paul Rudd, and, and it was a lot of fun. But then Judd asked if you would, Robert, would you do a, uh, would you just do a, a little triumph piece where you interview everybody yeah. in the cast? With John Lithgow. And, John Lithgow yeah. and Paul Rudd and, and uh, Judd and Leslie Mann and finally Megan Fox. And I actually asked the gentleman who was putting the piece together, is Megan Fox going to be okay? Because I don't really know her. I knew everybody else from Saturday Night Live, Live or, or something. Yeah. But I didn't know Megan Fox. <coughs> she said, she's great. She's excited. She loves the Conan show. She knows the bit. And then I could just tell that I was hurting her feelings a little bit. And um, and I just kept, <laughs> part of the bit ended up being triumph, explaining, this is what I do. I'm this supposed is. to <laughs> devastate people. You see, it's how I work. I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, it, it's it's never my intent. I so what's your no... instinct after that? Like, do, Will you circle back to her not in character be like, I'm so sorry. Oh, I did it right then, right after we finished shooting. I'm like, is that okay? Are you okay? I'm sorry. I, I didn't, you know. It's, no, no, I'm fine. And you could sometimes, but, yeah. But, you know, it was that kind of thing where she doesn't really, she still doesn't, she doesn't know me, so she might not realize that I'm being sincere. Yeah. You know, that I might be doing this in some perfunctory way that I do with everybody I interview. But it, it was a rare case where I felt like uh, the person wasn't quite prepared for the kind of uh, jokes that were coming. And, and you know, i never interested in that. I, I Years ago, I said in an interview that I, I don't like ambushing people. It's not a stuttering John thing. Nothing against... Stuttering John, I always thought those bits on the Howard Stern show were hilarious, but but it just wasn't something that I was ever yeah. interested in doing, which, you know, was always this inherent uh, <laughs> inherent issue because I'm very good at making fun of things. <laughs> and, you know, it's like what I do. And, and if it makes me laugh, then I feel like it's worth doing as long as it's fair. Yeah. Again, like going back to what my dad said about the Sabra sketch. So, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a tricky thing. There's, there's times I got to meet Ellen DeGeneres once after making fun of her, actually. <laughs> that was a person, that was another person that I felt bad about. So Ellen DeGeneres was the center square in Hollywood Squares. Oh, you used to, I remember you And I was on Hollywood Squares. I was invited to, I did it in New York and then I was invited to do it in LA for a week. And 
so Triumph had a lot of jokes and uh, she actually wasn't always the center square. Sometimes it would be, I can't remember, Alec Baldwin, believe it or not, or Whoopi Goldberg, I think. And so I said, uh, yeah, I hear uh, Ellen, uh, you know, and this is right on the yeah. game show. I said, you're the best, Ellen, you know, and you're, now you look at you, you're the center square. Although I heard you're rotating with Alec Baldwin. That's uh, interesting. I thought you only rotated with chicks. <laughs> and... She had been laughing so hard at everything I had said up to that point, and then I could tell that she that was, like kind of she was like she she understood that it was funny, but she felt a little uncomfortable gotcha. about it. So I visited her afterward, and and I told her, I said, I wish I could be the kind of comic you are, honestly, and I meant it, the kind of comic who can get laughs just by observing things and just by their personality. Her, Kevin Nealon, there are very few like that, that they they can get laughs without making fun of anything. Yeah. You know? And it's a really unique thing. And, uh, you know, I try to, you know, if you watch my movie Leo or even the movie that I did with Adam and Chris Rock. Because you're doing a lot even, of children's movies now. So you yeah, can really I did take ho- your kids the Hotel now. Transylvania movies. Don't, don't get scared off from the from the Triumph sketches. No, no, no. They're, they're very accessible. But kid um, friendly. Yeah. And I, I try to make jokes that are more character based now and, and it's 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 a lot of fun. You know, it's it's easier to make fun of things. Yeah. You just but if you do it really well, it's still very satisfying. <laughs> so there's the contradiction. There's the uh, there's, there's one, the push pull. There's one person who again he, he got into a big fight with his producer who I believe produced the either the Dana Carvey show or some, one of the big projects you were involved in, but the the comedian who I love, whose yard site is on, is actually on Purim, and he did not leave children, is Gary Shandling. Mm. And the way Gary, uh, his humor, who, he was always the object yes. of his own, very self-deprecatory. Yes. I'm good. Did you ever interact? Did you ever cross paths with him? I got to play basketball at his house Oh, once, you were invited to one of the those famous... Games? basketball things and it was uh yeah i didn't live in los angeles so i never really have been a very big part of that community to be honest with you i had a great community of people in chicago when i was starting out and then now i've just been here all my life and i just have comedy writer friends and 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 i i live in the burbs and i don't really i miss out on a lot of that you don't hang out like the hot that hollywood no and i don't hang out at comedy clubs here and um you know, I just have my family in it. Sounds like you're more that. likely to spot you at a mincha than at a... <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> um, at, a, at a comedy club, it's a, I'd say it's a tie. <laughs> l- 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 let me let me ask you one one, one last question, because I, I really am fascinated. I brought it up before. I, I wrote a book on yeah. uh, sin and failure. I'm not here to, to push my book. My listeners are well aware of my... But mm-hmm. but there is uh, there was a show that you were involved in. It lasted only a couple es- episodes called The Dana mm-hmm. Carvey Show, which mm-hmm. was Dana's like... He had it, and it was a rogues gallery of like the greatest comedians yeah. of all time. You had Louis C.K., you had Steve Carell, yes. Stephen Colbert got his start on it. Bob Odenkirk, right, yeah. was on. Unbelievable. Charlie Kaufman was a was a writer. I still am trying to wrap my head. <laughs> and you were the one who hired him. Yes, and he had a comedic sensibility. I mean, you, his oh, sure. movies are like back then. He hadn't written movies. He had written uh, for a sketch show on Fox that didn't last very long. Can't remember the name of it. So he had some sketches from that. And then he had some other ones that hadn't made it. And it was, it was a decent sketch, uh, packet, but then he had one sketch that was a parody of unsolved mysteries. That was very, what they call meta. It's an overused term, but it hadn't been back then. And it was just so inventive and hilarious that that was enough for me that I wanted to hire the guy. And um, he was very interesting case because he he really did want to always write original strange stuff, and he hesitated about taking the job because he lived in L.A. But um, you know, we we told him what we were setting out to do, and um, but we were you know at the same time it was Dana Carvey. We were on a major network. There was a lot of pressure to spotlight what Dana does best. So, you know, when I would write a Regis sketch or a Ross Perot sketch, these are characters and impressions that Dana was well known for and was amazing at. 
there was a faction of writers who would be like, oh my God, we're really tra- <laughs> we're dragging that thing out again. Like, and to me, that was almost like a tribute to how talented the writing staff was that this show that was also putting out things like Grandma the Clown or other sketches that if you watch the documentary are featured. It's a, fa- it's a very, fascinating very documentary. Very strange stuff. Yes. And yet there was a faction of the writing staff that thought we were being too hacky. <laughs> Even at that point. Even like, at that point, yeah. So yeah. to me, one of the questions, because I, I wrote a book on, uh, I'm always fascinated with failure and coping with failure. And I'm curious for yeah. you, like on a personal level, when that show imploded, did you did that take a toll on you personally? Um, I felt very vulnerable uh, because I felt like a lot of the scapegoating was hit, coming my way because Dana was Dana. He's just a brilliant performer. So you know when a show like that doesn't work, you know you're you're not gonna. Dana's still Dana. They're they're gonna they're gonna come toward the people who you know made the choices and uh, of what to put on the show, and so. But fortunately, I had done a cartoon on that show called The Ambiguously Gay Duo. Sure. Which is one of the more successful things on the show. Another piece of work that may not still carry today. In well, well you, I, you reprised it fairly recently with a live action sketch. That was 2011. Oh. <laughs> Time has passed. Time has passed. I, I would say that sketch, I, I would defend the sketch because it was the parody the, really, the the target of that sketch was the villains who were obsessed with whether they were gay or not. Correct. So again, it's a sketch where the intent matters. Yeah. And in my mind, it was always written that way because it was almost an early sketch about identity politics because not only did I feel back in the early 90s that there was an obsession with you know, a game that people would play about celebrities. Well, is Tom Cruise? Is yeah, gay people or not? don't don't remember that, but that I I grew yeah, up in that people were world. obsessed with that. Yes, and um, it just seemed ridiculous to me. Uh, you know, the way, and and then you know, as a reaction, people, you know, latch on to that identity and proudly come out, Correct. and that's a great thing. But then again, when I talk about how sometimes. The media just wants to feed our anger and and, yeah. and and divide us. And that's that's an example of where identity politics sometimes becomes unnecessarily antagonistic, you know, because people, um, I, I mean, it just come, boils down to like, when, when you take anything too far, whether it's a religion or a sexual preference or someone's ethnicity or race, it's not the only thing that defines a human being. Yeah. You know, and, and that was sort of what that sketch was supposed to be. Correct. Um, did you get, did you get criticism for that? Like back then? No. But now, like do, are, is, now is, there are people who will again? say not really. I mean, it's, it doesn't get attacked like the way, Black, you know, like blackface, blackface Jesse face. Jackson yeah. or Jimmy Fallon playing Chris Rock. Yeah. Uh, whatever that was back then. Um, no, it doesn't get, it's nothing that anyone has said, Oh, he should apologize for that now. Uh, not at all, because I think people do understand that there was an intent to it that was... Um, but but go, going back just the Same night. way Blazing Saddles, nobody is... People talk about how, oh, maybe that couldn't be made now, but everybody understands that Mel Correct. Brooks and you see the, the best graciousness. Intention. It shines through, I think, a lot of times when you do it. But I'm curious, when that when that finished, now everyone's going their own separate Dana, ways. Dana Carvey show. Yeah. Yeah, so that spurred me to think of a bunch of other cartoon ideas that summer. And, and, and ended up running on SNL. And Lauren Michaels just embraced it, and then I had a brand new career. So it was a way for me to dig myself out of this hole incredibly quickly did you feel (laughs) any responsibility did you feel like i wanted to say i'm sorry to the other people who were around you was there any dana carvey show you mean yeah oh i when people i said to dana carvey i'm sorry the day we got canceled i was like i i'm I'm so sorry i I wish we had because i did feel responsible in that i didn't understand the time slot that's the only thing i felt that none of us had really thought through. You followed right after Home Improvement. We followed Home it? Improvement, which in my mind was a show I hadn't really bothered to watch. Didn't yeah. interest me. But on the surface, 
I saw that Pamela Anderson was in it. I knew Tim Allen had some sort of a criminal record. <laughs> yes, he's supposed and to be I a wild just thought, guy. Okay, he's got to be some kind of edge to this show. And uh, I think I say in the special that about five weeks into the into the Dana Carvey production schedule, I finally watched an episode and I realized, oh no, this could easily be an eight o'clock show. The reason it's the number one show on television is because parents watch it with their kids. With their There's kids. something for everybody in that show. And what a disaster that we didn't think this through and that we started the first episode with such a scatological sketch correct but 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 what's nice is that your humor has kind of come full circle now like you're making children's movies that are now like you could watch with the whole family well i have kids i have you know (laughs) I, i mean i have daniel and i also have twin boys and um when i wrote you know i sort of fell into a hotel transylvania that was not my idea that was a movie that had been in development for a long time it landed on adam sandler's lap and he brought me into it but my kids were like three years old at that time, and um, they had become my life. And uh, this was, I had, I was no longer at SNL, and Conan had moved to Los Angeles, so I wasn't really a part of his uh, universe except for an occasional Triumph sketch. So, you know, I was interested in making movies. I'd written Zohan, I'd worked on Adam's uh, Jack and Jill movie with mostly the Al Pacino stuff. And then, Adam offered me this movie and the fact that it was a family movie kind of uh, attracted me because I, you know, the biggest joy in my life was, was making my kids laugh and, and, and make, and them making me laugh. And so uh, writing Hotel Transylvania came easily to me because uh, it didn't feel like any kind of like I was slumming or anything. It felt like a fun challenge to write for kids. And then I wrote a second one, you know, co-wrote both of these movies. And, um, and then uh, the Leo movie uh, is about a class of fifth graders. And, and I started writing it when my kids were in fourth grade. And it's, it's a lovely um, message. And, um, and, I, and again, it's a very Jewish kind of, you know, uh, theme of, of just... Um, that our lives were that we're here for each other, and uh, you know, I cannot thank you enough. I, I want <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I want to return pleasure. back a, a a my final question before our rapid fire questions. Coming back to your original yes. original post, which which mm-hmm. I found incredibly moving. Oh, okay, there, there there there's one word that I, I think for a lot of reasons I I, I think I understand why I, I don't I don't think it was in there which is which is Israel itself and I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about mm. your relationship if you've ever been there or anything your yeah. relationship um, to Israel y- young experiences you ever traveled with yeah. your with your family uh, or... my parents brought me there when I was eight years old first time then I went again in my 20s all each time I went with my parents and sister and then uh, finally, I went again um, in the mid-90s. And oddly enough, we went right after Rabin had been assassinated. Wow. And um, we got to uh, really experience that. Uh, the heartbreak at the peace process, not just the man, but the peace process being... Sure. Um, halted. Being, and- being halted by you know, by a Jew. Yeah. Which was, was such painful. a shock at the time. I was a young time. kid, but yeah. Yeah, it was a shock at the time. And, you know, and it sort of set the table for all the conflict within Israel sure. that's happened since, you know. And, um, you know, between what are characterized as the extremist Jews who, you know, did not want the peace process to continue that way. And, um, and that's where that assassination came from. And, and, and that continues to exist today, that tension between these two factions that, mm-hmm. um, you know, really um, has complicated sure <laughs> everything has. Yeah. since then. Um, I haven't been there since then. Uh, really? You've yeah, not been there well, once. Well, you know what? I mean, a lot of things have happened since then. Then, then I had a son, and the son uh, was autistic, and that kind of took over our lives for a long time. And, um, and we had, uh, you know, um, I mean, he was, 
just helping him and making his life better. Uh, we, ne we never traveled after that. We never traveled out of the country after, after he was diagnosed uh, to Israel or anywhere else. Uh, you know, we took uh, smaller vacations and, uh, you know, uh, I feel like, and then we had twin boys uh, years later and um, yeah, it just hasn't been, just hasn't been in the cards for me to travel a lot uh, um, because of, you know, a, a lot of family responsibilities have just been somewhat overwhelming at times, but in a great way, the best way. So. There, there, there is nothing holier. Um, the most holy unit of measurement in the Jewish community is the family. And there's nothing holier right. than it. And the fact that you have centered your family and have advocated, especially um, for your son, uh, is really, really uplifting. It is extraordinarily moving. And I am really grateful uh, to be able to sit with you today. And Thank I'm you. so happy that you came out. I always, I always end my interviews with more rapid fire questions, uh -huh. just a, a little quickies. Um, I always love book recommendations. I'm curious oh, if there are any specific books on comedy or Judaism. You could pick either one. Uh, I'll just recommend one book on comedy, which is Steve Martin's book called Born Standing Up. An absolute love it. Love, yeah. love it. That's it's a real fantastic. gift to anyone who's interested in comedy or interested in that, that um, era of comedy or, or in Steve Martin. I never thought I would see someone like him break down his thought process that led to such a revolutionary approach to comedy. Yeah. And uh, the fact that he was generous enough to do that was a, a real gift. My next question, I'm always, I'm, I'm curious if you were given a great deal of money, help, whatever you needed and allowed you to take a sabbatical with no responsibilities whatsoever to go back to school and get a PhD. Ooh. What do you think you'd want to study? Wow. Wow. So it would have to be something that has nothing to do with my passion, which is creating comedy, right? No, you could, if you, if that would, no, I wouldn't want to do that. That's so that would comedy be, is that, that would be, like I said, that's like way, oh boy. Wow. Uh, might be psychology, might be, again, going back to, uh, uh, political science and, and that's a, uh, well philosophy too oh my god that's a hard one we'd love to, to see a dr robert smigel there's <laughs> no question it's a hard one to narrow down <laughs> i mean you know even religious studies would be i mean uh, you know something that would uh maybe it would be religious studies because uh you know, I'm just fascinated by the similarities and differences between religions and uh, it's kind of on the intersect of philosophy psychology it's all there yeah, and, um, you know, and something I said in that post that, you know, you, you talked about how uh, how I bemoaned the fact that it's so easy to just like, oh, there's a big man in the sky, yeah. how stupid, you know, idiots, he doesn't exist, and like, you're just missing out on so much when yeah. you dismiss religion like that. And, and what I said in that, uh, you know... Uh, when I said in that post, I think was something to the effect of like, it's just a, such a shame that religion gets um, co-opted and, and uh, you know, exploited and, and bastardized by narrow-minded people um, to the point where equally narrow-minded people just lose complete interest in it yeah, and dismiss it. And, you know, and then just want to say, oh, it's the cause of all wars. And yeah. It's, you know. They flatten it into just. Yeah. And like, it's not like there aren't truths to what they're saying, but there's a whole other side that you're missing out on. And it's, it's a shame, you know, it's been a real, <clears throat> it's been one of the things that's uh, guided me all my life. And um, 
you know, sometimes more intensely than other times. Smart, smart comedy, and I've always seen this with smart comedians. I think they appreciate. And you know who I actually hold up on this is the way Colbert, to us, Stephen Colbert, <laughs> he's, he's, he's he's deeply religious. He's deeply religious, yes. and he, you know, and he, yes. he'll talk, he'll poke, he'll poke fun, but. Yes. You see it's coming from a very real place. He doesn't flatten it. He doesn't... Uh, no, no, he's never apologetic. I'm very, very about. moved. I, I famously got rejected from a fellowship when they asked me for who are your uh, religious role models. And I mentioned a couple of rabbis, but I want. I said, Stephen Colbert, I find them very moving. <laughs> they were like, no, he thank you. He's very moving. <laughs> that was the end of my... I, no, yeah, it's funny where the, your role models can come from, you know? For me, it's like... My wife, who's not a very observant person at all, but she's one of my role models because of uh, everything she does for other people. Yeah, constantly. Yeah, just always. There's an understated humility that the, the the holiness that emerges from, so to speak, like ordinary people. I find captivating. Cause Absolutely, it's... and some of my favorite movies, and and like Leo, you know, I try to impart that message that there's for teachers too. That just the the value of passing on your knowledge is so uh, is is priceless, you know. And I've learned that not from not only from teachers, but from the people who uh, uh, have helped my autistic son over the years, yeah. and the patients they have, and and uh, it's just been uh, a real inspiration and gift to have those people in our lives for the last 20 years. A thousand percent. My, my final question, uh, again, <laughs> uh, I'm always curious about people's sleep schedules. Oh what time God. do you go to sleep at night and what time do you wake up in the morning? That is a problem. <laughs> Sometimes I'll fall asleep on a... I've got a couch that's basically like, it, it just dares you not to fall asleep. Uh, not a couch, a lazy boy kind of thing. Uh, something deeply Jewish about falling asleep in a, ca in, oh, in, yeah. in a in a thick, nice chair. Yeah, I'm not a great sleeper. I have I have uh, an active mind, and I stress out about things and uh, about about work that I have, you know, that I've got on top. You know, part of the problem of being in this field is that you're never totally in control of. You know, there have been times when I've like, oh, if I had been a dentist, I could have just I had I'm my Show own boss, yes. I'm my own boss, and I uh, and I work between these hours, and then I shut it off exactly, yeah. and then I'm just there for my family and for my leisure. I can watch serialized television <laughs> and really get into, which I don't. You know, everybody watches these shows that I just can't because I've just got too much on my mind at different times of the day that I, I can't like commit to a serialized television yeah. show like Breaking Bad. <laughs> can't do it. I can only watch things that are like, you know, you you can miss a few and then get back yeah. to it kind of thing. But um but yeah, that's uh that's not uh I, I asked, I, no, <laughs> it's I not asked something the, I've got control over. Yeah, no, I asked the question because I've had a lifelong sleep problems myself. I have that kind of like monkey brain that I, yeah. And, I, and then I'm like halfway through, then I'm like, how did I ever fall asleep? Like, how did I ever do this? Like, I can't even <laughs> remember. I used to have a ritual kind of existence when I was a kid, and I went to school, and then I shut that off when I was done with my homework. But when you have comedy ideas and projects and. I could be thinking about this. What have, what, what have I not done? And then, or if it's a personal thing about my kids, um, it's really hard. It's it's just it's a it's a messy, it's a messy kind of life where you know there's no there's no um, standardized schedule. And yeah. There's no locked in job. You know. I I just did a series on uh, on mental health and. Yeah. Um, my, I, I had one episode where I just spoke about my own struggles in this. Yeah. And all of this was, was about how these kind of roles where you're creating content, you, there's no, you have to create the vehicle, so to speak. And it's a big source of my own uh, sleep problems. I think back to this, I, I include in the episode this dialogue between Orny Adams and Jerry Seinfeld in the documentary The Comedian. Oh, where Orny Adams is like... Oh, right. I remember that. There's this dialogue where he's like, I look at my friends. They're lawyers. They're, they're, they show up. And and I, I, I appreciate the envy. I really, really, I really, really do. Yeah. And... Um, yeah. 
But oh, that energy and that heart that you bring uh, to your work means uh, so much to so many, particularly me, both on a Thank very you. personal level, and to continue the shining example of being a Yid and sharing Yiddish. <laughs> and, no, you are. You really are. Thanks. Uh, and I don't mean to sound like I'm... grandfather. Um, I don't mean to sound like I'm complaining about the schedule or the no. uncertainty. <laughs> I always feel very incredibly lucky that I got... To, to essentially follow my passion and, and make a living out of it. I feel incredibly lucky for that. You you continue bringing blessing to the world. Robert Smigel, thank you so much for joining thank you. us today.